course. So um, just uh, one reminder for today, which is uh, homework four is available on Canvas. It's been there for a week now, and it's due one week from now. And it talks about learning theory. Um, if you haven't already started working on it, uh, I strongly encourage that you do. Um, this homework could take a little bit time, like all homeworks, but uh, in a different way. Um, are there any questions or anything that you'd like to uh, get out of the way before we jump into the technical part of the class? Uh, did I say that I would drop homework one? No, I did not. Um, I didn't even hint at something like that, so no. Oh, no, uh, no, I, the plan was never to drop an assignment. Uh, uh, the, yeah, yeah, the, the, that was never uh, uh, in the cards. All right. Uh, and also, I don't know why you say we preface it with uh, not to be ironic because I don't know. Anyway, so uh, there's another question. How do we know whether a learning algorithm satisfies the error bounds of Occam's razor? Actually, uh, okay, so the question is Occam's razor or agnostic learning. Just want to clarify there. Uh, both of these things are Occam's razor theorems. So the question is, does it satisfy Occam's razor for consistent uh, learners or for the agnostic setting? And the way to think about it is uh, uh, think about the hypothesis class that your classifier is, exp is exploring. Um, and does it is it guaranteed to contain every possible concept, no matter what the concept is? If that's the case, then there is hope that your learning algorithm will find the true, uh, uh, the true model. So it's, it would look something like this. Imagine that this is your... Uh, uh, the concept class. This is the space uh, from which the set of functions are drawn. In, uh, all functions have to live inside this. Um, and now, um, I see that someone's writing on the thing. And now uh, you can, uh, the function, let's pick an example. Let's say the true function is somewhere here, but we don't know that. Um, and in the, uh, what does it mean for the learner to be consistent? The, when the learner is consistent, what that means is the hypothesis space that the learner explores is guaranteed to contain the concept no matter what the concept is. So, if the, Which means the hypothesis space is a set that may look something like this. So this could be something like H. No matter which concept we are talking about, the hypothesis space contains it, which means there is hope that some learning algorithm, maybe we don't have the learning algorithm at hand, but some learning algorithm could find the true concept. This is the consistent case. In the agnostic case, what would happen is if this is the concept class, let me draw a nicer circle. If this is the concept class. Um, the hypothesis may, uh, Maybe the concept class is this, but the learner is maybe searching over some hypothesis that could look, say, something like that. Once again, something like that. And it what that means is if the true concept is here, it's not going to find it. It doesn't mean that it's guaranteed not to find it. Maybe there's a concept here and it finds it, but what essentially that means is that be prepared for training error. It's also possible that the true concept is entirely, that the hypothesis space is entirely outside. So this is uh, C and this is H. It's also possible that the, 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 the thing is entirely um, um, outside. So uh, uh, this means that there's no hope that the learner will find the true concept. So the, 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 there is a, the, this, this presents an interesting question. Given a new domain, given a new task, uh, and a new data set, a new uh, learning algorithm, how are we supposed to know whether uh, it's going to be consistent or not? We've already encountered one consistent learner. 
which is the decision tree id3 if you run id3 all the way down to uh, uh, full depth you're guaranteed a training error of zero so essentially what you would observe is in this case training error is zero consistent means consistent with the training set so that's all we are talking about so it, it, it's not talking about generalization um, it, it's just about consistent it, it's just about whether the, the training error is guaranteed to be zero in this case training error is greater than or equal to zero we have no guarantee that it's uh, uh, perfect on the training set, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, it could get a non-zero training error. So let's uh, go back to some of those questions. How do we know this? Uh, so uh, uh, how do we know if it satisfies with probability delta? The probability delta part comes from the bound that we observed. It's got nothing to do with the consistent and all those things. Uh, how do it's? We are. It's not. We don't know. We are demanding that it satisfies. Uh, um, the the let, let me go back to the statement of the all the theorems. All the, the theorems say something like, if you have if the number of examples m greater than some expression, which is which contains one over epsilon, which contains one over uh, delta, and maybe something like the size of the hypothesis space. If this is true, then. Uh, uh, a classifier. I, I'm writing the consistent uh, learner uh, uh, thing. Let's write it this way. Then, with probability greater than one minus delta, classifier that has zero training error. will have generalization error less than epsilon. So notice that if we have these many examples, then with this probability we'll have. So the delta does not uh, come into the, 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 the delta is really, say it comes into the, the, the guarantee of will we find such a learner. Uh, going back to the question, uh, the other question about uh, the assumptions, we never know what the concept class is. Yes, we never know what the concept class is, so this is just an assumption. However, uh, even though we don't know the concept class, we can say something about the learner. And remember, this is a statement about the training error, not about whether we found, we, it's possible that you can get perfect training error and yet not have found the true function. So. It, you could have you you can find the you can find the uh, a classifier that fits all the noise in the data, and that also is uh, uh, connected to a question that comes about no noise. You can imagine that there's a lot of noise in the data, and let's say there's no contradiction. There's no example that in one place shows up with a positive label and another place shows up with a negative label. If you have a data set that may have noise but with no contradicting examples, then ID three will find a classifier that's perfectly Going to separate it. Why? Because you can keep dividing uh, the, the the data set till uh, you know. Rem remember how ID three works. It keeps partitioning the data sets into smaller and smaller parts. You can keep partitioning it till every leaf is uh, supported by only one example, which means that you know that label will go to that leaf, uh, the, the leaf node. So you can you can find the the, the uh, tree that perfectly classifies data provided the data is not self contradictory so id3 is consistent and uh, we don't know what the true concept is but if you run id3 you'll get a consistent classifier so there's another question about uh, uh, what about depth limit and i'm not going to answer that because that's in some sense what your homework question is asking you to think about um, i gave a big hint now um, if you keep uh, making the tree deeper and deeper you can fit a lot of noise could uh, let's see. Uh, there's another question. Could the training error be zero and still uh, not find? We we may have not found the true function. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the 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 training. It's uh, so. This is uh, this is one of the interesting uh, slash annoying points about this whole thing, right? Uh, 
uh, remember, we uh, I, I'm going to use the example of Boolean functions because it's just easy. Suppose I have two variables, x1, x2, and a label y, and I give you one example. Oh, let's say I give you two examples. This is a plus and one zero is a minus. There are still two rows of the truth table that we do not have. I can find many, many functions that fit these two things perfectly. So for example, one function that fits it perfectly is uh, y equals x2. So let me use one and zero. But then it, the training error is zero, but maybe uh, the generalization error is exactly wrong. So maybe the true label is uh, uh, one zero again here. So in fact, here the training error is zero and the test error is 100%. So you know, we, it's entirely possible that could happen. If this could happen because we are searching through the wrong space of functions. That's happening because we uh, decided to fit the noise in the data. Maybe these two data points that we had were both noisy. Maybe the labels were flipped by an adversary. So uh, the training error could absolutely be zero, but the true function could not, need not have been found. The, uh, the, the, what the learning theory part of uh, this class tells us is if the training error is uh, zero or if the training error is low and you have enough number of examples, if you have a large number of examples, then the likelihood that the training error is zero and yet we didn't find a function that is close to the true function is small. This is where it's, uh, this is the uh, function being close to the true function. And this is saying the likelihood of finding uh, such a function is, uh, well, this is the opposite direction. The likelihood of finding a function that is close to the true function is uh, pretty high. So um, the, 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 if enough examples exist and such weird situations that uh, like the training data and the test data not being comparable happen, don't happen, then a classifier that is good enough on the training data will generalize better. Um, so when determining the VC dimension, we are playing this game of seeing if our function can perform binary classification. Um, would it make sense to see if the function space could shatter a set of points belonging to three or more classes? So the question uh, to uh, put, uh, word it differently is all the theory that we have seen is about binary classification. Can we extend it to multi-class? And the answer is yes, there are extensions of this uh, idea to multi-class. I can point you to references. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll, I'll send you an email uh, or you know you can post a discussion message or something. Um, on that note, uh, what do we do in the uh, with decision trees when there are contradictory examples? At least one of the examples seems to, uh, in the project seems to have this property. There are a few different things you can do um, and uh, there are, uh, all of them involve assumptions. For example, you could say something like uh, um, uh, if the, uh, you pick the majority label, for example, you toss a coin, essentially at that point, you just have to uh, weigh in one way or the other. Uh, and that's the best we can do. Uh, on slide 44, it appears that uh, Occam's razor is, uh, yeah, so the, the, there's a slight, uh, I understand that there's a slight bit of confusion in the slides. Uh, Occam's razor is the general idea that uh, the, the the sample complexity uh, depends on the size of the hypothesis class or depends on the VC dimension. Uh, this is instantiated in four different ways. In fact, uh, we can think about it this way. We have uh, training error is guaranteed to be equal to zero and the training error is greater than or equal to zero, which means we don't have a guarantee of it being equal to zero. This is one axis. And the other axis is uh, the size of H is, uh, or H is finite. And here H is infinite. This was the first thing we saw. All of these would one way or another be called Occam's razor. Uh, the first thing we saw was uh, when the training error is zero, this is consistent. And this is agnostic. Um, and here it, uh, we had a result that said something like uh, one or the sample complexity is one over epsilon log size of H plus 
uh, log one over delta. I should have given myself more room. Uh, here you have one over two epsilon square log size of h uh, plus log one over delta. And which basically means the main thing that we have to worry about is the log of this thing. And in this case, we have some, uh, in this case, basically in both case, both of these, the VC dimension matters and I never remember the expression uh, that goes into this. But basically you get an expression that is uh, uh, in one over epsilon, one over delta and the VC and same thing here, except these are slightly different uh, expressions. Um, and this is like the four uh, things that we saw. Okay, these are all good questions, and uh, um, uh, and I see that uh, I've answered the last one also. When the training error is greater than zero, it's not greater than zero. When the training, I would be a little bit more uh, careful than that. It's not that when the training error is zero, it's agnostic learning. When the training error is not guaranteed to be zero, it's agnostic learning. Doesn't mean that it's not allowed to be zero. It's just that we don't have that piece of information. So essentially, we are asking. If we do not have that piece of information, how many examples would we need to pay in order to get the sample, uh, the, the pack bounds? And it turns out essentially in the, um, in the case where uh, uh, in the finite hypothesis class space, epsilon gets squared here. That's the big difference. You pay more examples to get the same guarantee. So for this piece of information. So the, essentially the cost of that information is roughly one over epsilon. It is super important, of course. Okay. Um, so uh, this is good. I'm gonna now move to uh, uh, so, you know, the lecture and I've decided to uh, move things around in the plan. And uh, the original plan for today was uh, boosting and ensembles, but I thought I would do that after finishing support vector machines. So today we're gonna to look at support vector machines. And uh, today and uh, definitely uh, Tuesday uh, and hopefully just that, maybe it will drag on a little more. So uh, just to kind of uh, make sure we are all on the same page, uh, we were talking about linear models quite a bit uh, in terms of classification. And then there's also this question that uh, has been with us through uh, the big, from the beginning of the semester, how good is a learning algorithm? How do we know whether a learning algorithm is good or not? One way to answer that is uh, through uh, this framework of online learning and mistake-bound learning. And uh, under this framework, when applying this framework to linear models, we observed that we saw that uh, we saw the perceptron algorithm. There's, there are other algorithms in this uh, framework also. Another simple one is called Winnow uh, or uh, exponentiated gradient. They have these uh, really cool names. Uh, we only saw the perceptron algorithm. But uh, there's another way of answer, asking the same question. How good is the learning algorithm? We can answer that question used by working inside the PAC framework or inside the agnostic learning uh, uh, setting. And when we apply this uh, perspective to linear models, we get uh, the, 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 the family of algorithms that we get uh, includes support vector machines. And that's what we're going to look at. Doesn't mean that these are the only ways to answer these questions. Uh, there are other ways to ask that answer that question. How good is the learning algorithm? I could say um, uh, I could answer this in a, from a Bayesian point of view, and we'll get a different algorithm for this. We'll get other linear, other uh, learning algorithms, other named learning algorithms for uh, linear models. In particular, we'll look at logistic regression, for example. But today we are going to talk about support vector machines. Um, first, I'll talk about this. Uh, general notion, uh, intuition for uh, learning with uh, learning by maximizing the margin, and then uh, build this up into uh, an objective function that we want to optimize. And this would be the SVM objective function. Um, definitely not today. Hopefully on Tuesday we'll talk about solving this optimization problem. If time permits in the semester, we'll talk about uh, this notion of duals and kernels which is a really, really cool, cool uh, part of machine learning, which unfortunately is becoming less and less fashionable. Um, um, I hope it comes back in fashion because it's fun, but uh, because it's unfashionable today or it's less popular, I've decided to um, keep uh, this part for 
if time permits and instead spend the time on things that are uh, things like neural networks. So of course, uh, we're not going to cover all of this today. Um, the plan for today is hopefully I'll finish this and hopefully I'll finish this or at least get to a big part of that. So let's talk about uh, what is it, uh, this intuition for learning by maximizing the margin. And I want to go back to this VC dimension thing. So from uh, the, the, from, the, from the lecture on VC dimensions, we saw this expression here. The generalization error, the true error of a classifier uh, is going to be bounded by, is going to be, so we can ask, if the training error is error S, how much worse can the true error be? This is the training error. How, how bad could the classifier be? And uh, uh, if you have M examples, the, the, the theory tells us that the training error, the, the true error, error D, is going to be no more than this expression above the training error. This is an expression in terms of uh, VC dimension. We don't get to control delta, we don't get to control M, uh, but we do get to control uh, the VC dimension in the choice of our hypothesis space. So implicitly, uh, or actually explicitly, what this says is if you want your generalization error to look very much like your training error, essentially you get a uh, generalization perform if you, performance that is close to what, what you see during training time, then you make the VC dimension small. If you make the VC dimension small, the thing in the box becomes very small as a result that could, you can think of that as a learning strategy. I want to find that classifier that has the lowest, that comes from the lowest VC dimension. But that seems like a tricky uh, situation. But the, 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 this is one thing that we've seen. So this is just an observation. We can train a classifier uh, by, uh, I've erased all, I've, I have hidden all the ugly part. And the only important part of that is we want a low VC dimension. A lower VC dimension gives a tighter bound. This is one piece of information we have already seen. There's something else that we've already seen in class. The VC dimension of a linear classifier in D dimensions is D plus one. This is something that we saw at the end of the VC dimension lecture. So doesn't this, it almost seems like this is a constant. So we don't get to control this. I mean, if somebody gives you a feature set, essentially it looks like uh, we don't have any, uh, any uh, knobs to control. So, the question that uh, motivates uh, SVM is to think about, are all linear classifiers that separate a data set identical to each other? Let me show you this, uh, let, let me inter uh, illustrate this with an example, but uh, before that, uh, I wanna remind you about the notion of margins. Margins are going to be a, a, a companion through this lecture. So just to uh, remind you, the margin of a hyperplane for a particular data set is the distance of the uh, hyperplane and the point that's nearest to it. So if you are given this line and a collection of points, the margin is uh, this distance here. Uh, it's, that's the point, this is the gap that we have around, it's a, the, way to, the way to think about it is the, the margin it gives you the gap around the, uh, the line or the hyperplane where we are guaranteed there are no data points. As a result, uh, you know, the, the, if you, um, uh, yeah, the, the, we'll, we'll get to the result in a bit. So now, so given this, notice that there are many, many lines that can separate this data set. This is a line, this is one line that separates the data set. I could have another line that uh, goes something like this that also separates the data set. Every line has its own margin. So it's this, uh, band around the line where we don't have any training points, something like that. So the question to think about is, suppose we are given multiple lines, all of which are equal in terms of training error. All of these have zero training error. They perfectly separate the data. How do we know which one we should pick? Let's make this more concrete. Let's say you have this data set and uh, you have a you have these two options some somehow these are the only two options you have to choose which line do you think would have better generalization error 
And uh, while you're answering that, I also want you to think about why this is, uh, you know, how do you motivate this choice? Now this is an imp this is a the, the the a rather subtle question. Why would one line be preferred over the other when all of them are equal in terms of uh, their performance on the training data? Implicitly, when you choose one H one uh, over H two, what you're doing is making an assumption, making an assumption about the nature of the data, and saying, I believe that among all lines that are perfectly good in terms of classifying the data, you're imposing a preference among all lines that are perfectly, uh, that are perfect uh, in, in terms of separating the examples. So these lines of this kind are preferred for some reasons that are not coming from the data. This notion of uh, introducing a preference over hypotheses in ways that are not driven by the data by training examples is called regularization. We'll talk a lot about regularization as we go along, but essentially what it what we are talking about is imposing a preference over functions without actually relying on data, but for other reasons, in this case, generalization. So uh, uh, the, the poll's been out for a while now, I'm going to uh, end the poll. Uh, majority of you seem to have chosen H2, and a few of you have chosen H1. And I'll be curious to hear maybe one person on each side of the uh, thing uh, explain why their choice, uh, explain their choice. So uh, one argument is it's easier for H1 to make a mistake, which implicitly suggests that uh, uh, you chose uh, H2. Uh, does anyone want to uh, speak up for H1? So, so there's so there are a couple of people who are justifying H2 for the same reason. Uh, something I was thinking about, Ashton says, um, why you want H2 is it would make it would take a more wild outlier for H2 to make a mistake. I like that. That uh, uh, the, the the idea of outliers being wild is a uh, is a nice mental image. And yes, uh, again, that's a justification for uh, uh, H2. And in some sense, I don't see anyone arguing for H1 here. Either you're very shy or uh, uh, these three arguments have convinced you. Uh, but it, it, in some sense, the argument is right. A new example that's not in the training set has a higher chance of being misclassified because this, this gap here is too small. Um, every so um, um, the, the 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 every uh, new example has to if it has to be correctly classified. In this case, we are talking about positive examples. New examples that have to be correctly classified are only given this much room. Whereas for the H two, it has a little bit more room. Think when you think think margin, think margin of safety. There's a bigger gap for. Uh, to quote Ashton, a wild outlier to kind of deviate from uh, uh, the pack. So uh, the couple of questions, what happened to epsilon in the previous slide? It's uh, epsilon is really the, uh, the how much it is the gap. It's error D minus error S. Um, every time, and the, yes, every time you try to think of an argument for H1, it ends up being pro H2. So it's right. So the intuition is here is uh, H2 is a better, uh, choice, but this is kind of weird. Nothing in the VC dimension tells us anything about this. The VC dimension of both these lines is three. The VC dimension of lines in two dimensions is three. Both H1 and H2 have the same VC dimension. Both of them would have the same, according to the theory, both of them would have the same um, uh, generalization error bound. So some things, this suggests that our theory is lacking something. This suggests that the theory, when we are talking about VC dimensions, is uh, not complete. This was the observation that uh, motivated Vapnik uh, 
to work on this uh, to define something uh, to, to to define uh, vc dimensions of linear classifiers in terms of the data intuitively larger margins are better or another way of thinking about it is suppose we consider all functions so uh, all linear classifiers that have a margin mu1 and let's call those functions h1 let's think of another set h2 which is all linear classifiers again separating the data with a margin mu2 now let's say mu1 is more than mu2 if mu1 is more than mu2 then intuitively based on the same argument that we saw for this picture intuitively all functions of type h1 are better than all functions of uh, type h2 so how do we formalize this thankfully we don't have to formalize it wapnik has a theorem for us if you have a set of linear classifiers that uh, separate the training data with a margin of gamma the same margin that we saw with perceptron the same margin that we were talking about now then the vc dimension is not d plus 1 but it's bounded by the minimum of r square plus gamma r square over gamma square and d plus 1 here r and gamma are exactly the same terms that we saw in the perceptron mistake bound r is this radius of the smallest sphere containing the data and d uh, and gamma is the margin of this hyperplane so what this means here is originally we saw that the vc dimension of the thing in the absence of any data before we saw any data the vc dimension was just uh, d plus 1 but what wapnik ended proving is uh, the vc dimension is the minimum of this quantity d plus 1 and r square over gamma square plus 1 which means that if you make the margin gamma larger and larger this quantity keeps going down so here's a strategy for finding a classifier find that linear classifier that perfectly separates the data and maximizes the margin makes the gamma as big as possible because if gamma becomes big this quantity becomes small which means the vc dimension becomes small larger margins imply lower vc dimension and lower vc dimension implies better generalization bound so we now have a, a concrete plan the vc dimension bound that we saw in the beginning was a rather complicated expression but if you want to make this quantity small the hope is we try to make this quantity small and keep this one small so we try to make the sum of these two things small instead of that we try to make the vc dimension small and the training error small basically what we get is this uh, idea among all classifiers that separate a data set find the one that has the largest margin and that's going to give you the best generalization bound this intuition is the learning strategy that gives us uh, the support vector machines we want to find a linear separator that maximizes the margin i'll pause here for questions before we start uh, concretizing the strategy so uh, ask me questions i will not be proving that theorem i can uh, so there is a uh, wapnik has a fantastic textbook where uh, the theorem uh, 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 he goes into a lot of detail how do you calculate r in four plus dimensions it's uh, it's basically what it's the, the simplest part of it uh, the simplest way to do that is you imagine that i'm 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 not going to draw any pictures because we're talking about four plus dimensions imagine you have x1 x2 xn and each of these has a label so suppose you have uh, all of these things what is r r is the radius of smallest sphere actually it's not just sphere it's hypersphere because we're talking four dimensions that contains the data this is a rather complicated way of saying r is simply the max over 
among all examples, find the one that's farthest from the origin, and that's going to be the radius of the uh, the smallest uh, sphere that contains everything. I hope that clarifies it. Um, so before, ah, before it said that the VC dimension of H is d plus one, is this a lie? Um, that's a good question. I said the VC dimension of H is d plus one, provided we know nothing about any data set. In the absence of any data set, all we know is that the VC dimension is uh, the, so remember, what, what, is the, what is the VC dimension? VC dimension is, VC dimension of H is uh, the number of points you can shatter and such things. So it's basically the uh, uh, saying, it, before any data comes along, the VC dimension is d plus one. But once we see a data set and we observe, get a sense of a little bit more information, classifiers that have to classify with a margin gamma have a lower VC dimension because that because you are trying to put this gap, no longer are we talking about uh, just a line separating points. We're talking about this band on both sides of the line, which means that we are restricting how much we can move this band. So the VC dimension is going to be lower. There are It's going to be able to separate fewer points. Um, so this seems non-intuitive because uh, you might think that high VC dimension is a good thing because it's more expressive. Um, but low VC dimension is good because it's more generalized, generalizable. Do we generally want lower VC dimension? The answer is yes. This is, uh, this is the fundamental uh, idea that I want you to take from the entire semester of the class. Not about VC dimension specifically, but lower complexity is better. Um, this is an assumption. It's just, it's, it, you know, it's almost a philosophical point. Lower complexity is better among all explanations that perfectly, or, or among all explanations that are equally good in terms of explaining some phenomenon, like a data set, pick the one that has the lowest complexity. This is Occam's, Occam's razor. How do you define complexity in terms of VC dimension? Why? Because lower VC dimension functions can are more unlikely to uh, explain some phenomenon by accident. A function that has a high VC dimension can fit any data set. So it might just fit the noise. But if a lower VC dimension uh, function performs as well as a function that has a high VC dimension, the assumption here is it could not have been an accident. Now, this is an assumption. This is like a fundamental uh, assumption that if you think about it has been the driving force behind a lot of scientific discovery. Uh, I, I Usually uh, it, when people talk to me in office hours around this time, I start talking about Copernicus and uh, uh, the heliocentric model of uh, the solar system versus the thing that uh, was before it. Simpler explanations tend to be more robust, provided if they explain the data as well as a more complicated explanation. And VC dimension is a measure of simplicity. Why would the VC dimension be a function of R and gamma? The, uh, the, the reason it's a function of gamma is uh, somewhat easier to explain. It's, it's a function of gamma because uh, if, um, uh, if, you're, uh, uh, if this hyper, hyperplane, let's take a line, and it has this, let me see if I can draw this better. Say you have this line and you have a band around it that uh, that's like the margin. Among all the lines that, uh, if, if this band is really small, that means you basically can move the line around and still separate the, uh, you know, you can separate a lot of points. You can shatter uh, you you can you, you have all lines of this shape. That means you can uh, match the labeling of many many uh, things. However, if this band was really thick, imagine that this band was not uh, it was much thicker. That means you don't have the luxury to move this around because there might be a point in the way, and that point would get labeled the wrong way. For example, so, um, so you will no longer be able to separate the data points. So essentially. Don't think of hyperplanes as just a line. 
but think of it as this band as this uh, uh, as this rectangle that you are placing this infinitely long rectangle and you are supposed to put points on both sides of the rectangle so that's the uh, intuition for the gamma now r, r is actually uh, interesting the, and we'll actually uh, talk about this uh, the same intuition uh, as we go along but gamma by itself is not uh, a complete definite uh, complete uh, thing because if i tell you that the margin for this particular band is this much that does not tell you anything because by itself you, the data could be scaled and suddenly the margin seems really large does this mean that we can just make a classifier much much better by just zooming in of course not so the, the, you can't just zoom in and make the classifier better and as a result we'll have to uh, somehow normalize this thing and uh, it turns out the right way to normalize is to assume that points lie inside the unit circle or equivalently that all the, that everything is uh, scaled by r square so the scaling factor is uh, this uh, uh, is a, is a degree of freedom that we have and uh, r square gives you or takes away the degree of freedom okay so going back to the um, going back to where we were what we just saw is just the idea of uh, was there a question lian while you type i will uh, 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 keep talking here so what we saw is uh, the idea that um, you know among classifiers that separate data sets we should impose a preference for classifiers that uh, have a larger margin or equivalently we can just say my learning objective is to find a classifier that separates all the data and has the largest possible margin so i can set up um an optimization problem just to make sure that we are all on the same page we know from learning theory that lower vc dimension can lead to better generalization we know via wapnick that uh, vc dimension depends inversely on the margin by the way this wapnick is the same wapnick as the v in the vc dimension vc is wapnick chermen and kiss um so uh, linear the for linear classifiers the vc dimension depends inversely on the margin which means larger margins give better generalization so let's learn a classifier that has the largest margin let's go back to what margins are so uh, at this point the geometric perspective becomes very helpful so we have a linear classifier margins the distance of the i mean it's defined by a, some in this case it's a line we have in two dimensions we have a line uh the margins defined by the distance of this uh, closest point here it could be uh, on the positive side or the negative side i'm just showing the positive it's uh, just to remind you this is the expression for uh, the distance of a line from a plane or a, a point sorry which is uh, equivalent to y w transpose x divided by the norm of w so this is the margin but the important thing is we don't really care about the values of the w's we only care about the we don't in, par in particular for a new example that may come in we don't care about the value of b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 we only care about its sign that means we can scale uh, the w's and the b's by any positive number because they all represent the same equation because we only care about the sign the sign doesn't change if you multiply um, the b and the w uh, by a half or by a thousand it's the, a point that was classified as positive by the first equation they are all the same equation we could multiply and divide the coefficients by any positive number we're going to take advantage of this uh, in a bit so let's start setting up the optimization problem so the margin of the hyperplane is the distance of the closest point to that plane so the margin of uh, uh, the hyperplane defined by w and b gamma wb is among all data points which are defined by i so you have a data set which consists of examples xi and yi among all examples of this kind you 
find the one that has the lowest value of y times w transpose x divided by the norm of w. So this is just the margin of this hyperplane. But our goal is not to find the margin of the hyperplane. Our goal is to find the hyperplane that has the highest margin. So we're going to, the learning criterion is maximize among all w and b the gamma uh, for that wb. So this is your learning criterion. So we essentially want to solve this optimization problem. By the way, as a uh, side note, sometimes in the literature, this expression here is called the geometric margin because it's exactly that distance. The numerator alone is called the functional margin. And uh, uh, it's just a name that maybe you'll encounter at some point. But going back to the thing, we want to find, uh, oh yeah, there is a problem here. This is, what's a min i? Yeah, this should be a min, right? Among all, yeah, of course, thank you. So among all points, um, we want to find that point that's closest, the maximum gives you nothing. So we want to find the uh, point that is closest to the hyperplane, so which is the closest distance, and this is the distance to the hyperplane. And we want to find the uh, classifier that maximizes that quantity. But how do we solve this problem? Let's now, this, this as you can imagine, this, is, uh, this can be a rather ugly optimization problem to solve because if you write it in full gory detail, the optimization problem we are trying to solve is max over W and B min over all I, Y, W transpose X plus B divided by the norm of W. So the next question to think about is uh, how on earth are we going to solve this optimization problem? It turns out to solve this optimization problem, we might have, we can actually uh, do a little bit of massaging of this expression and set up a, uh, and convert this to an equivalent problem that uh, is well studied in the optimization literature. So that's what we're going to uh, do right now. So let's to, uh, to as a starting point, Note that we only care about the sign of uh, this expression and not the magnitude, which means we, uh, we can multiply and divide the Ws in the B by any constant and uh, things are, it's basically uh, going to be the same, uh, give us the same uh, sign. So instead of minimizing uh, this, in, instead of maximizing this quantity, uh, we can maximize this quantity for any C. We can choose the C that makes life convenient for us. The key observation that uh, drives the uh, pro progress towards the SVM objective is what if I uh, scale, choose the scale uh, C such that this distance here is exactly the number one, which means for every other point in the data set, this point here, or this point here, or any point here, the distance is more than one. Instead of, uh, if, if that happens, then the numerator of this expression becomes, uh, sorry, not the, the whole distance is one, but this distance is one over the norm of W. For every other point, the distance is more than one over the norm of W which means this numerator, we, we can choose a C or implicitly choose a C such that the numerator is fixed to one. And for all other points, the numerator is uh, more. This, we have that degree of freedom because of the same reason that we saw before, which is uh, we can, I mean, it, 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 it's equivalent to the same reason. Instead of uh, uh, looking at this data set, I could be zooming in or out so that that quantity becomes one over uh, the norm of W for whatever W we are considering. So, which means this expression becomes, if the numerator becomes one, we are left with, with that particular careful choice of C, we are left with uh, one over uh, the norm of W that we want to optimize. Provided all other points, are at a distance more than or equal to one over the norm of W, because this is the, this is defined to be the closest, right? 
So we are just massaging the thing here so that we will get an optimization problem that is equivalent. But this thing here, W1 over C, W2 over C, I don't want to carry around a W and a C and all that. I can just rename this to W1. I can just rename this to W2 and just solve for that instead. Because I'm going to be, every time I see a W, I'm going to divide by C. So why bother learning the W and the C separately? Just rename the thing to W and uh, W1 over C1, or I could have renamed it as U1, U2. It doesn't matter. It's just a uh, term that we are going to uh, uh, use any, uh, you, you know, optimize over anyway. This means that instead of, um, the, instead of uh, uh, solving for W, B and everything, I can try to find the W and B such that this point, every point is at least at a distance of one over the norm of W. And this closest point is at a distance one over the, exactly one over norm of W. Uh, just to kind of summarize this whole thing, the margin of the hyperplane is the distance of the closest point to the hyperplane. So this is not max again, this is min. And we want to maximize this margin. But because we only care about W and B and not the, the, the sign of uh, uh, the Ws and Bs being correct uh, and the sign of W transpose B, uh, W transpose X plus B and not the actual value, we can move the points, we can scale the, the whole thing around and set the absolute score, which is the functional margin, which is the numerator of the closest point to be one and allow the W to adjust itself. In other words, maximizing W in, in general is equivalent to maximizing W, maximizing the value, finding the W that has the maximum value of one over the norm provided the closest point is that has, uh, has a numerator equal to one. So um, let me uh, pause here for questions because this is a somewhat uh, tricky thing. And honestly speaking, this is an idea that um, not everyone gets the first time they see it. You have to kind of let it uh, sink in. Uh, I'll pause for questions while uh, uh, I see there's one. This looks like it's going to be a batch learning algorithm. Yes, it is going to be a batch learning algorithm. We are not going to look at any more online algorithms. Um, it's close, it looks like it's closely related to Voronoi cells. I'm not exactly sure how, so I don't know. I, I don't know how you, uh, maybe it is, but I don't necessarily see the connection right away. Are there other questions? Would we be changing uh, the C to make the numerator one for every line or many different Cs? It's basically for every line, it might have its own C. And we are actually going to get rid of the C because uh, we have decided that we don't need to actually keep track of the C explicitly. We have this uh, W1, we are only going to track W1 over C, W2 over C in general, W over C and this quantity. So this is going to just be our W and this is just going to be our B. Um, and uh, allow the, the, the scaling parameter to adjust itself. So effectively we'll be, um, our goal is to find only one of the one line. So we don't care about the other things. And in fact, as you will see, we, we are not going to, or as you may realize, the C is just a fiction that I invented uh, so that I can explain it. But in fact, we are just going to uh, optimize only the Ws provided this thing is at a distance one over the norm of W. For that W, the C would have automatically adjusted itself. I mean, the C is in effectively the uh, distance of the closest point. Okay, so I don't know if there are more questions, but I guarantee there are, I, I'm almost certain there are more that people are not asking. Uh, I encourage you to revisit this because uh, this is a, a slightly subtle argument. So please kind of go over it once or twice if necessary. 
um, and come back with questions. But for now, what I would like you to uh, observe is our goal is to maximize one over the norm of W such that the closest point has an absolute score of one. Let's write these two things more concretely in math. I want to maximize the norm of W. Maxi sorry, ma maximize the one over the norm of W. But that's if I want to maximize one over the norm of W, that's exactly the same as minimizing the norm of W. The norm is a slightly painful object to deal with, but that's exactly the same as minimizing the squared norm of W. But the squared norm is uh, simply W transpose W. Um, and we are going to introduce a half here so that uh, when we take the gradient, just like we did with least mean squares, we don't have to carry a constant around. So this maximization is identical to this maximization. But that's not it. We have another condition. We want the functional margin, this quantity here, y times w transpose x plus b. Notice that I have start, uh, dropped the b because uh, uh, we'll have, a, I don't want to keep, do the bookkeeping. Uh, we want that quantity y times w transpose x plus b to be equal to one for the closest point and more than one for every point, every, every other point, which means for every data set, y times w transpose x is at least one. Together, we, are, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the, 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 op op the objective that the first pass of object, uh, we'll build it up in a few uh, passes, the first version. The optimization problem has an objective that says, um, minimize half norm of uh, half W transpose W, which is exactly the same as maximizing the norm one over the norm of W. The condition says, it condition needs to be true for every example. And in particular, for the closest example, you will see equality here, which will ensure that the numerator is one. Um, so I see that there's a question that's been answered in the chat, so I'll not uh, go past that. This op optimization problem minimize uh, the norm of W such that uh, Y W transpose X greater than or equal to one is called the hard support vector machine. It's called the hard support vector. The, the word hard here is not because it's difficult, but because uh, it makes a hard decision. It's it, it, it's it, uh, uh, it, it demands that every point should be correctly classified. So there's a clarification question. How was I able to drop the B? Uh, I dropped the B assuming the same uh, sort of syntactic trick that uh, we used for perceptron. I'm assuming that now starting here, examples have a bias dimension and the weight vector carries the B around so that I don't have to say W transpose X plus B all the time. So I have, all I have done here is declared that this optimization problem is my learning problem. I have said nothing about how I'm going to solve it. We'll talk about how to solve this optimization problem at another time. So let's again uh, revisit uh, or rather uh, just as a checkpoint, look at where we are. Lower VC dimensions lead to better generalization, larger margins, lead to better lower VC dimension. So larger margins lead to better generalization, which means the strategy for learning is to find the classifier that has the lowest, uh, sorry, the largest margin. Um, equivalently, this, is equi the, this problem, it turns out using this sort of a geometric argument is equivalent to finding the weight vector W such that that is the smallest such that all example for every example, y w transpose x is more than equal to one. So um, there's a clarification question. We are taking, and that's exactly right. We are taking the min over all the w, uh, the min of what? The min of the norm, the length of the weight vector, all the w's that correctly classify the data. You must have this expression must be awfully familiar to you because this is something similar to what we saw in the margin perceptron. If you look at it. If you think about it. 
we have this gap of uh, uh, at least one in this case. So effectively, if it's a gap of at least one, it means it's more than zero. This means every point is correctly classified. That's why we are talking about the separable case. Among all weight vectors that correctly classify the entire data set, we prefer the one that has the lowest value of W transpose W. This is the intuition. Two questions uh, in the chat. Why do we have the name of support vector machines? Uh, that's an intriguing question that has to do with uh, the dual of the optimization problem. If time permits, I'll get there. Um, the in, uh, we'll get there hopefully if time permits, otherwise you can ask me in office hours or I can point you to the slides or some reference. Um, but there's a nice story for that. Um, what's the guarantee that the data is correctly classified? And that's a fantastic uh, segue because what if the data is not correctly classified? There's no guarantee that the data is correctly classified. So maybe uh, you can tell me um, what will happen uh, if the data is not correctly classified? Um, if uh, it, the, the suggestion is we cannot find a W, yes. What will happen to this optimization problem? There's also no margin because if the data is not correctly classified, the margin is not defined. In fact, if you want to think about it very mechanically, uh, think about it this way. This is a constrained optimization problem. We want to optimize this quantity subject to these constraints. So we are not searching over all weights. We are searching only over those weights that satisfy the constraints. If the data is not separable, what that means is that there is no single W that satisfies this constraint. Um, the, if there is no W that satisfies this constraint, let's look at this uh, minimization problem a little more carefully. This minimization problem here is actually among all uh, uh, points that are in this d-dimensional thing, such that this satisfies the constraint. But if the constraints are not satisfied, the search space for this thing is the empty set. Essentially, what we are saying is among all weight vectors in the empty set, find the one that has the minimum norm. Um, basically, uh, if you want a more programming language analogy for that, that's basically an exception. That's a, we are uh, among all things that don't exist, find the one that has the uh, vector that has the lowest norm is not a well-defined question. This, uh, this is an infeasible problem that has no solution. So if the data is not separable, this thing breaks. And that's why uh, we are calling this the hard SPM. We are imposing a hard requirement. So um, how do we fix this? So there's a, a comment, this feels like a better perceptron. Uh, uh, I, I tend to agree with that, yeah. Um, the, there's a suggestion. Can we relax the constraint by combining it with the function to be minimized? We will do something of that kind. Essentially, we are going to start, we're going to kind of uh, build up towards that idea of relaxing that constraint. How do we deal with data that is not separable? Does this mean that we cannot find a classifier? What if we want to find a good enough classifier? We don't want to find a perfect classifier. We want to find a good enough classifier that correctly classifies as many of the points as we can. Can we massage this optimization problem so that uh, we can set it up? Let's do that. The, the intuition is that we are going to allow some data points to break into the margin. Let's take this data set, which is not linearly separable. You cannot put a line anywhere in this, on the plane that correctly classifies the data. But just intuitively looking at this, it almost feels like this point here is an outlier. It should not have been there. Either it should have been classified as positive or it should just not exist. In fact, even this one feels like an outlier, even though the point is, you know, if uh, we remove this red point, this uh, uh, plus in the middle, if that point didn't exist, you would have had such a large margin. Can we now set up this uh, trade-off by, you know, just deleting those points and finding this large margin classifier? 
if you can find, if you can do that, then we get a classifier that has a large margin. But at the uh, 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 the trade-off is that we are incorrectly classifying these two points. Uh, well, actually, we are not incorrectly classifying this point. We are definitely incorrectly classifying this one, and this point is breaking into the margin. Can we do that? It turns out we can. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, the, 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 this separator has a lot, the, the trade-off is that by paying this cost on the training data during training time, we have a larger margin and we might actually get a classifier that generalizes better. So if we can do this, we are trading off training accuracy for better generalization. Let's set that up. Um, the hardest, this is, uh, we are going to soften this, essentially we are going to soften this constraint. The hard SVM said that every example should be placed, uh, should be, should have a, uh, the, should have a functional margin of at least one. YW transpose X should be at least one. Instead of that, what if for every example we introduce, we give it a ticket that, allow, that allows it to break into the margin as much as it wants. That's called a slack variable. The xi i, this is the Greek letter xi, xi. Uh, we introduce one slack variable for every example, and we demand instead of yw transpose x being greater than one, we demand that yw transpose x should be greater than one minus xi i. We allow every example to break into the margin by an amount xi. So this is in the picture, this quantity here is the psi for that example. And for this one, this quantity is a psi. The negative example should have been on this side, but we are allowing it to break into the margin by this amount, so that's the psi. Um, yeah, you can call it the margin within the margin, but uh, I've never seen it said that way, but uh, sure. But you can't, of course, you don't want the side to be negative because otherwise, uh, it, I mean, we are, this is like the, the slack we are allowing and it, I don't know what it means for the slack to be negative. So if the slack value is zero, uh, either the point is uh, on the correct side of the margin or even on, you know, far away from it. So for all points on the, that are far away, the slack variable will be uh, zero. So, but the thing is, you know, this is a problem. This means that if the if uh, if we are uh, so, let's first look at the constraints. So we instead of this constraint here, we've said uh, instead of saying every example should have a functional margin of at least one, we are saying every example should have a functional margin of at least one minus psi i. We are relaxing the condition, and then we are demanding that uh, the psi should be positive. But then there's one more thing here, which is don't allow too much slack. Try to find the smallest slack that you can find, uh, you, you can get away with. Otherwise, you know, you can just set psi to be infinity, uh, which means YW transpose X is going to be more than negative infinity. And that's trivially true. So we are not going to, we are, when psi is really large, that means we are discarding that example. We can, in theory, discard all examples and call, uh, call it done. So we don't want to, allow examples to break into the margin. And so we are going to ask that examples pay a certain cost. How are we doing that? We are adding an extra term to the objective. We are saying in addition to finding the lowest weights, also find the smallest total slack. Um, so the, let me rewrite this uh, whole expression here. And uh, you know this, hopefully you should be able to kind of reconstruct this from the beginning. Um, but let me work through this. The first term comes from this uh, notion of maximizing the margin. Maximizing the margin is equivalent to minimizing the norm of the weights. The second term is saying you minimize the total slack. I want to allow as few examples as possible to violate the margin and even that by as little as possible. There is a trade-off term, a new hyperparameter that we have just invented. That, uh, is, that's a trade-off between these two terms, C. It's essentially saying how important is it that uh, if C is large, that means 
this minimization problem is going to find it is going to be influenced more by this term. If C is large, that means I want to keep the second term as small as possible because that's the penalty that you have. The, the think of minimization as uh, the you know you're paying a cost to choose a certain value of W and psi. If C is large, that means you have to pay a large cost to make psi big. If C is large, that means you care about fitting the data perfectly. In, at the limit, if C is infinity, that means you demand that the classifier should overfit the data. If C is zero, that means, you know, I really don't care about slacks. Just if you want, discard the entire data set, but I want the, uh, the first term to be as small as possible. Sure, you can discard the entire data set. That means you can set uh, psi each psi i to be infinity. That means this quantity is trivially true for no matter what weights you pick because y w transpose x is greater than or equal to negative infinity. This is always true irrespective of what w you pick. Given that I want to minimize the c because uh, the, that means I just find the w is a zero vector. Essentially, I throw out the entire data set and say, here's a weight vector, the zero vector that gives me the lowest thing because uh, uh, that's what happens when c is equal to zero. Um, so let me just uh, kind of step back and see where we, how we got here. Um, of course, uh, we started with lower VC dimension, better generalization, larger margin, better generalization. And then we talked about the hard SVM, where we say you maximize the margin by minimizing the norm of W such that all examples have Y W transpose X greater than or equal to one, or all examples have a functional margin of at least one. But then this only works for separable data. When the data is not separable, what we do is instead introduce one slack variable, one psi i for each example, and uh, solve a, slight, a, a relaxed optimization problem. This one here that says maximize the slack, maximize the margin, and minimize the total slack so that as few examples as possible uh, violate the margin constraint. These slack variables allow the margin constraint to be violated. Um, there's a question. How does how do you, uh, this involves the, the yeah? This is a multi-dimensional uh, uh, optimization problem, and we'll see how to solve this optimization problem in the next lecture. Um, but the last thing I want to do today, and maybe five minutes is uh, about enough for that, is this optimization problem uh, by itself. In theory, you can solve it. This is a special kind of an optimization problem uh, called a quadratic program. Oh, there's a question. What is the slack variable again? So going the slack variable is uh, 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 introduced here to deal with the fact that for every example, y w transpose x need not be more than one. The data set may not be separable. If the data set is not separable, we want to allow the example, the luxury of violating that constraint. What do you mean if you say y w transpose x is greater than or equal to one? Instead of saying greater than or equal to one, I can say it's greater than one minus some slack psi i. And this is where I have to reveal that I don't know how to write the Greek letter psi, so I just draw a squiggle. Um, so I want this quantity y w transpose x to be greater than or equal to one minus psi i. Um, and for an example that is uh, that. Uh, is on the bad side of the margin, psi i will be positive. So for this example, psi i is greater than zero. For this one also, psi i is greater than zero. For all these examples and for all of these things, psi i equals zero because they don't need to violate the margin constraint. They can very well um, be on the right side of the margin and uh, we don't need to give them this extra. Essentially, what we are saying is, I want to find the maximum margin classifier among all points, except the ones that my optimizer chooses to ignore. How do you choose to ignore it? By weakening this constraint on those points. By weakening those constraints by an amount that's equal to psi. Now, if you are not careful about that, that would mean that you're allowing this, you, you might allow this constraint to be violated for all examples. 
if you allow the constraint to be violated for all examples, then uh, we are essentially throwing out the data set. Instead of doing that, what we do is we demand that, sure, allow examples to break into the margin by an amount equal to psi, that's the slack, but control the total amount of slack that we allow. Don't uh, allow all examples. I, I mean, if you do not use a non-zero value of psi i, because remember, we are minimizing this thing. Any psi that's not zero will increase this objective. We want to make that as small as possible. So we want to minimize not just the uh, norm of the weights, but also the total slack. That way, we don't allow examples to break into the margin unless we gain something from it. What could we gain from it? We could gain maybe uh, uh, this example was not correctly classified, so uh, there is not uh, is the is a noisy point. So uh, we could gain the fact that we are actually able to solve the problem, or uh, alternatively, by move by ignoring that point, we might be able to find a better weight vector in terms of the norm of the W. So either way, we are gaining either uh, the ability to solve the optimization problem, or we might be gaining generalization ability. So the slack variable allow is uh, a positive number associated with each training example that says, can this example be uh, uh, ignored when we are uh, uh, defining this constraint? Is there a case where, um, yeah, so is there a case where this method would prefer a bunch of small slack rather than one really large slack variable in one example? Absolutely, yes, because really what we are saying is I want to minimize the total slack. So that could no, that could totally happen. There's a trade-off there by giving, and that at that point, the choice would be determined by the first expression, the norm of the W. If it turns out that by preferring a bunch of small slacks, you get a smaller norm of W, the optimizer should absolutely prefer that. Okay, so there are two minutes left, and uh, maybe that's enough for me to talk about just one thing. Actually, you know what? No, I'll not because uh, that opens up a whole new set of things. Essentially, what we will see next is uh, I'm going to rewrite this expression. So I'll just tell you where we are going here. This uh, optimization problem is a belongs to a class of optimization problems called quadratic programming problems. Quadratic because this is a quadratic expression and programming, it comes from uh, uh, a World War II era term that just means think of it as optimization problems. A QP, a quadratic program, has a, uh, a qu quadratic uh, objective here. And in the, it turns out the constraints are all linear. The quadratic programs have been studied since uh, for decades now, and there are, uh, the, the, there are standard algorithms to solve them. And so at that point, you know, once you see this objective function, and this is the case that was uh, in the 90s, once this objective function is written, you can say, okay, problem solved. Let me now uh, give this off to those optimization people in the math department and they can deal with it. I don't have to deal with it. It turns out that uh, this is a very special kind of an optimization problem and we can essentially uh, rewrite this optimizer, th this optimization problem to get rid of all the constraint, to get rid of all the slack variables and get us a optimization problem that we can directly throw into a stochastic gradient descent thing that uh, of the kind that we saw for uh, least mean squares. We will re do that rewriting the first thing on Tuesday. And uh, it also gives us a very cool interpretable version of the optimization problem that uh, is going to take us to a really broad point about modern machine learning. So um, of course, uh, I could not have hyped this up anymore. So hopefully all of you will come back on Tuesday uh, feeling excited about this. Um, don't forget your homework. Um, uh, I strongly suggest you work on it if you haven't started it and I'll see you all on Tuesday. Thank you.